Hello, everyone. If you are just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be Digital Identity, A Look Ahead. I'd like to welcome Kalia to the stage to introduce our next panel. Welcome, Kalia. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Um, our panel today is called um, Digital Identity, A Look Ahead, and I'm here with Paula Berman from Democracy Earth and Supriya Roy from IDENA. Um, I'm not gonna take panel time to do in-depth introductions. We all have really fantastic bios that you can find um, on the Radical Exchange site. Um, but all of us have been exploring the future of digital identity. And I wanted to get it started by sort of laying a little bit of context about where identifiers are today. So I'm gonna pull up um, a few slides to do that. And the way they work today is that we end up going to a whole lot of different sites and getting a whole lot of different usernames and passwords. And we're divided up into a whole bunch of different people. And it's sort of a problem. We end up also, um, our digital selves end up um, in someone else's namespace. Um, so, we also have had this innovation, the identity provider. So these large companies represent or, or host our digital identities and they end up in between us and everywhere we go. And another choice that we have and, and folks who are innovating in my community um, that, that started the Internet Identity Workshop um, came up with is that you could own your own URL, but there's a problem with this because we actually rent them. So we end up in, and we have another choice. We could rent our phone numbers. Uh, it is a global namespace that's globally managed, but those phone numbers are not ours. If we stop paying our phone bills, we are no longer the owner of those phone numbers. Um, so we end up in a world where we have two types of sort of names that we acquire. We have those blue ones from large global central entities and these um, these other ones, uh, these private namespaces that we interact in. And I just wanted to name this up front because of all of the things that we're discussing today break those paradigms and shift into a future where we're more in control. And there's a lot of experimentation happening at this frontier. And so we're gonna share three of the different um, options. So I wanted to turn first and let, um, Suprio share um, what, what Idina has been working on and then we'll hear from Paula and then I'll share a little bit more about what my communities are working on and we have some questions for each other and, and we'll take questions from the audience too. So I'll turn it over to you to Suprio to share more about what Idina is doing. Sounds good. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for the uh, really great introduction. Um, yeah, uh, without further ado, I would go into sharing my screen instead. So um, yeah, uh, for, first of all, uh, I have not been someone who has been part of the core IDNA network. It's also uh, because I'm just a community member uh, alongside thousands of others who are there now. And that is just central to the ethos of um, IDNA itself, that it's about uh, anonymity as well as creating a unique identity. So um, the way we uh, sort of looked at um, identity and the history of how Idena started was going back a little bit where in the offline world, um, people just used to have identities defined as human attributes, right? You have your face, you have your voice, you have your personality. That was what identity was, identity was all about. As we progressed further, then came institutions. You had governments, you had monarchies, and that's when uh, people sort of started getting issued documents about land ownership, about property ownership. And then the next frontier came, which is what we are in today, where the exact same authorities went online, and you have a new set of authorities, which were the big names like the Facebook and the Google of the world. And that took a whole new meaning where all of these attributes were now sort of digitized and live 
on the internet per se. Now, this is all jolly and good, right? We are progressing with technology. Um, however, the problem which came in was things like this, where the moment you started uh, putting critical personal information on the internet, um, you were actually privy to um, bad actors where your information was now available for everyone. It was compromisable. It was something which could be spoofed and um, someone could impersonate you and do something else. Um, this was one aspect of it. The second aspect was you were starting to sort of get into this increasingly big brother future where you were feeding all of your data to this central hive mind, which could then use it um, to create a very transparent and yet a very comfortable cage for you. Um, so something which I'm showing here on the left side is called depth shaming on WeChat. So you can look it up. There are plenty of uh, articles online. And what this sort of uh, created was that uh, it was sort of connecting back into what George always said, that nothing was your own except the few cubic centimeters in your cell, right? That, that's your brain. And uh, that pondered us the question um, that what if there existed a digital world where I could just simply flourish, flourish by being myself without giving away any of the information which attached to me, which created that bias and prejudice that existed in the world today. And that's where we sort of looked into alternatives and that's what motivated me to join IDENA because IDENA was essentially about providing an alternative where it talked about a simple universal right of my conscience, um, my humanness, my um, basic right to just say that I exist. And that's what, I mean, it was. And uh, in its essence, it was bringing identity back to the grassroots where we started. And we were drawing parallels, right, where um, this, is, this is a tweet from last year where someone was comparing an Apple Pay to a Bitcoin. And you could see that how the central um, systems and infrastructure can restrict you, can censor you, can ban you from using something which is truly your own and how you could see that people were sort of pushing back against it. And crypto identity uh, is what uh, in its essence identity is. It's about something which is not centrally issued. It's about uh, something which everyone has an equal right to, regardless of their ge uh, geography or demography, and equal voting rights. And the way IDENA today works is it is sort of globally validated. So the people who are identities are the people who validate everyone else. So it's a collective conscience and it's a, a collective global network. And it also keeps bots apart. More on that later, um, why it's needed. Um, and how it works is there is a central validation ceremony, which occurs at the exact same time, um, at the exact same day, which we call an epoch end. And the way it works is it asks an identity to prove its uniqueness and prove its humanness. So the way human, humanness would work is all the candidates who are there as an identity would pass a Turing test very similar to like how the capture test exists today, but a very different format, which I'll explain a little later. And uniqueness is because all of these identities come online at the exact same time and the timestamp. So that way, if hypothetically you would attempt having multiple identities, you couldn't because you couldn't validate them at the same time. And the way this particular Turing test works, it's called a flip. So in ident IDENA network, um, flips are essentially short stories created by people for the people where um, a candidate is essentially picking a left sequence or a right sequence based on which sequence defines a meaningful story. Here in an example, you would see it's a um, dirty trouser. You went and put it on a wash. After wash, you put it on dry. And then after dry, it's a new pant again. So that's essentially how a typical story is depicted. And why flips are such an effective way of doing this, it's because it's one of the Turing tests, which is part of an AI hard problem where AIs can't solve stories yet. And uh, the kind of um, uh, Turing test we would want to do something like this is something which is super easy for understanding for human beings, but extremely hard for AI to solve. That way, bots cannot penetrate the network, but humans can easily get into it. 
And um, the way the flips have been working, this is how a typical IDNA client in session looks today, where you have a series of flips you get through. Um, people spend anywhere between five to six minutes at every epoch, which today happens between 12 to 30 days, which keeps growing. And the idea is that after you hit a certain identity count, it will only happen once a month on a Sunday. Um, so that's something uh, which is going to add that convenience bit of it. Um, and uh, it has been really interesting. Uh, the second part is how flips have been evolving. So flips are not, you know, very generic stories. These are like really complex things which people have been creating on the network where we have been seeing flips related to the current crisis. We have been seeing flips related to the pandemic, uh, all, all sorts of things, which is something which um, AI simply cannot create today in our current infrastructure. And what we have been seeing uh, is as this identity protocol has been building further and further and more people joining in, there is a very vibrant community uh, of developers who are actually building a really parallel ecosystem on top of it, which essentially is just requiring an IDN identity to go and sign up, create a poll, create a um, text message, create a fair drop website, create a blog, which is um, uh, really mind blowing uh, looking at how um, interesting this uh, journey has been in the last couple of uh, months. Um, uh, back to you, Kalia. Oh, thank you so much. Um, and that was really fantastic. And I'd love to for Paula to share more about what she's doing at Democracy Earth. Thank you, Kalia, and thank you, Supriya. So I'll tell you um, about the specific work that we're doing, but also start this with some context. So with Democracy Earth, we are uh, non investigating the intersection of democracy and technology, which today might make a lot of sense, but it was not always that obvious, but we felt strongly that this, you know, needed attention and, and the story of the organization traces its roots to a political party in Argentina, where the co-founders uh, created an open source software where people could vote online and on the, on the bills that were being uh, voted in Congress. And then the idea of the party was that every candidate could uh, vote. If elected, they would vote in Congress according to how citizens voted online. So this was called Partido de la Red, the Net Party in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And, and they kept developing the software. They didn't elect a candidate. They did get 20,000 votes, which was a lot for a very new party. It was extraordinary but the main thing was that i think they got to spread this idea uh this initiative on trying to connect people to uh, participation using software using open source software so um i think that a lot of people who are interested in identity just to frame you know why why does it matter why are we here discussing this it's because a lot of us kind of start from a point that has nothing to do with identity. And then we slowly realize that there's no way around it because you can't really do activism on a global scale if you don't solve this, you know, really, really, really thorny issue. So I, just to explain why, why did it make sense for us? So we began doing pilots with software where people could vote and we tried many different kinds of uh, interesting democratic models, liquid democracy, quadratic voting. We did a really uh, great pilot last year with the state of Colorado, all kinds of different models which you can create online and are great, but we, we have understood throughout time that the core of the issue is not just creating, going out there and creating a nice interface for people to vote on, but the core of the issue is creating a protocol for identity because that's the main uh, vulnerability. Actually, Edward Snowden said it just like that. He, he gave this conference in uh, the Web3 conference last year. He gave this 
uh, keynote and he said that identity is the key vulnerability being exploited in every system. So if you, so this is where, you know, where movements fail. And this is also where a lot of uh, the bad things that we're seeing in our world, you know, people hacking our democracies uh, and manipulating public opinion it all traces back to identity and to the fact that we don't own our data and we uh, have no control over what it is done. And, the, and the, the groups who own it, those who, has, who have access to that data have this enormous power, have this totalitarian power to manipulate us, to manipulate our politics and to manipulate our society. It's a, it's a frightening thing. It's a dystopic thing and it's real. It's already happening. The dystopia is here. It's not something that we should be scared of. You know, what if this happens in 10 years? It's happening, you know? And of course, I don't wanna be like political here, but it is noteworthy that right now, the person sitting in the main most important political chair in the world, the president of the United States, was a reality TV show star. So meaning someone who is able to grab our attention and our attention is really being manipulated. So, you know, just starting off with this, uh, you know, why this matters. So I, I was also not interested in identity. I was interested in increasing political participation through uh, digital tools. Yeah. And then, and then came to this, uh, in 2017, we, with Democracy Earth, we decided to start to write this white paper collectively on GitHub. So people from all over the world, me included, we just started thinking, uh, the name of the white paper was the social smart contract. So what would a social contract look like? in the age of cryptography and blockchains and smart contracts. And then it was funny because we, we wrote all about, you know, things that I just mentioned, the issue with our data and how we can expand means of participation. And then it was like divided in three sections. And the third section was dedicated to identity and also economics. So we, we proposed this idea of attention mining which is that we could kind of authenticate each other. We were like, you know, shooting in the dark a bit. We were experimenting. And this is uh, a lot of, I think, what is cool about democracy. Surf. You know, it's this idea of really um, experimenting and, and thinking openly and widely about ideas. Uh, but we were thinking about the idea of attention mining that we could, with our attention, with this new kind of source, uh, of scarcity that we have, which is our, our attention, we could bootstrap a network uh, of self-sovereign individuals. And then if we had this network of only humans where we would authenticate each other with our attentions, then we could have a universal basic income on top of that, based on time <laughs> to make it even crazier. So a, a coin anchored on time. Um, and then, it was one of those cases where uh, a lot of different people are kind of converging towards the same point because IDENA, you know, emerged with this uh, proposal, which is basically also using attention. You you go there, you you look at those two captures, and you choose, and you pick, uh, you do that caption, you pick which one of them makes sense, and then. I, I also found a post by Vitalik Buterin where he, I think the name of the post is 15 hard problems in cryptography. And one of them is the Sibo attack, which was this problem that was formulated in the nineties. And it basically outlined that it's in a distributed system, it's impossible for you to ensure that one entity will not control multiple entities. So it has this name. So, so one person won't be able to create a lot of fake IDs. And it's, uh, it has this name from a, from a movie of someone that has a multiple personality disorder. So the civil attack, you know, it's a, it's a major issue. And he proposes that something that can be done, uh, he speculates that something that can be done 
uh, to tackle the Cibola attack is to use as a substrate some to do some kind of test that only humans can do and not uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a lot of people, he wrote that in 2014. So I think a lot of people were kind of slowly starting to converge towards this idea, which is very different. It's a different field of investigation than that of, uh, I think what you're more focused on, right, Kalia, which is how to create the, the architecture, right? right. For that all of us uh, kind of own our data. This is more like trying to figure out a consensus mechanisms for identity. So in the same way that uh, proof of work which is the consensus mechanism behind Bitcoin, behind blockchains, uh, ensures with a distributed network that you cannot take one Bitcoin and I can't send the same Bitcoin to you, Kali, and to you, Suprio. The a new proof of humanity consensus is looking at how to uh, how the network can ensure that one person cannot create two identities. And by definition, you know, those who are exploring this idea thought that this should involve something that is easy for humans and difficult for artificial intelligence to break. So some uh, when we when we started writing this, a lot of people, I got the feedback sadly from a lot of people that, you know. The paper is great, parts one and two are great, but the third part is like absolutely crazy. And I think I, you know, and me and Santi, when we were collaborating on this, we really thought we were possibly losing our minds, but we were courageous and wrote this out. And, uh, and I, I was shocked, to be honest. I thought that this was something that we were exploring and maybe, you know, in five years or 10 years, something like that would come up. And then Idina comes two years later and has the entire thing, you know, put up, you know, it's a consensus for decentralized identity. It has a universal basic income. It, uh, you know, I'm not saying that they drove the inspiration for us, but I just think that it, it was an idea that was like bound to come. And, and even, I think around a month ago, someone lived for one week with the universal basic income from the IDENA coin DNA, yeah. which yeah. is mind blowing, which is mind blowing. And I just really, I know that I'm supposed to talk about democracy, but you know, this is, <laughs> it's an achievement. It is an achievement that this is happening. And of course, there are many ways in which IDENA can break, but it's a new way of going about things. One of the things that I do worry about in terms of identity and having a fully anonymous protocol is that you, um, you know, when we think about fully anonymous forums, we think about people writing horrible things. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what are the dynamics that are going to emerge in the apps based on IDENA and if that can serve or not as a way to have, you know, democratic discussions. Um, but with that said, with Democracy Earth, we were looking in amazement at this kind of proliferation of different protocols for identity emerging, especially last year. And in addition to those, there was, last year was kind of called the year of the DAO. The DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization. It's a new kind of institutional model where you have a smart contract where people pull funds and then they vote on how this can be allocated. And this was in, in 2016, if I'm not mistaken, a big DAO was created, the DAO, and it was hacked. And this was kind of very traumatizing for the entire ecosystem and not there wasn't a lot of innovation up until last year. And then last year, the Moloch DAO was created which was a contract that only had 400 lines of code. Thus, it permitted, it was very easy to fork it and create on top of it. And it has some very interesting game theory to it. And then we thought that this, and we saw people creating more and more DAOs. And these are very specific kind of smart contracts uh, to be looked at because they involve people making decisions. There are humans behind those contracts. So 
we started to think of, okay, Idina is, you know, amazing, uh, but it, it's also, it, Sorry, it we has have, fiction. We have a question from the audience. So Idina, just to clarify, is the system that Suprio presented earlier, just so you're not confused. Keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Idina, you know, that it's, it's a high friction system, right? You have to be there. I think that this, the ceremonies for identity relation are happening around once a week. So you, so you have to, you know, be going to those, attending those ceremonies. So, and maybe some people are not interested. They want to validate their identity in other ways. So we are exploring uh, how to kind of, quantify how to create a probabilistic framework for identity. So instead of saying this entity, there's a human behind this, uh, this internet entity, or there isn't a human, it's a bot, you know, put it on a spectrum and then drive metrics from the activities happening in DAOs and then possibly in the future from other sources as well, different identity protocols like IDENA um, and others who are doing great work as well. And then just start to create a framework where we can quantify this. And then on top of it, have people have kind of a meta governance for DAOs where people also rate the legitimacy of those DAOs. So there's a paper out there. It's called, uh, if you go to paper.democracy.earth, you can check it out, but it's still very experimental, but I'll just show you the prototype, um, which is on molochdemocracy.earth. Um, and basically here, this is the Moloch DAO, which is, uh, let me go back, which is one of, which is that DAO, which I mentioned that spearheaded kind of the, this new emergence of DAO, though there are different protocols as well. Aragon is doing a great job and DAO stack as well. You can see that it has $600,000 in it. So as real funds and people are voting on the different uh, different projects connected to the upcoming platform of Ethereum. And then here, you don't see the names, you just see addresses that are part of this. And then if you click on an address, uh, you can see the activities of this address. This is all publicly available information. We're just kind of putting it in this format. And here we have a very basic personhood calculation. So we don't know what is this thing, it's <laughs> uncertain. <laughs> but the idea hopefully is that also as zero knowledge proof advances, so this method where you can kind of uh, prove something without actually showing the information. So for example, I could prove that I'm above 18 without showing my real age. So we hope that people can kind of demonstrate that they control keys that have a certain score and then aggregate them and say, and if you need, because the, the whole idea is to be able to do governance, right? For humans. So with, with an aggregation of, of keys where you don't have, where you, you can have pseudonymity, right? You can register for, be a part of different organizations with different names um, and then uh, show with an aggregation of them that you are, a unique human <laughs> behind all of that. So the idea is for it to also be very difficult for you to get there. It's an idea that we're exploring with. I think, uh, you know, a few years ago when we were tinkering with, you know, the social smart contract, I think that it was wildly uh, experimentative. I don't know if that word exists, but, you know, here we are and I'm, I'm excited to, to continue trying. And I think that we should be, at the end of the day, it's not about how Democracy Earth is doing or how IDENA is doing or how, you know, these different data architectures are doing it. I think it's about creating, you know, a wide variety of options and alternatives to these big, you know, models yeah, that we have. Definitely. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm um, going to share just a little bit about the technologies coming out of my community around self-sovereign identity. And like you, um, Oops, wrong thing. Here we go. Slides. Just one second. Um, 
I got inspired not so much by identity, but by, um, ah, no, not the whole screen. Stop, sorry. It's there, okay. Um, I got inspired by wanting to connect um, folks working on transforming the world and making things better. So Planet Work was that community for me and they were putting two things together really early on too, looking at the environmental crisis and technology. And now that's really common, but in the year 2000, when they hosted their conference, it wasn't. And um, out of that community, they, they also collectively wrote a white paper, the augmented social network, building identity and trust into the next generation internet. And that paper is really found, formed the basis of the work at the, that I'm inspired by. And the vision they painted was a, a network where, where organizations would have their own autonomous digital identity and people would have autonomous identities and you would have open standards for identifiers and data exchange that would connect them all and on their own terms, right? So then we would get the effect of a, a Facebook, but we would have open standards and open protocols be the unifying glue and not um, just one big company that we're all really upset with right now. So there's a lot in between, but I wanna skip ahead to what we've innovated now, which is really around taking um, digital credential, like credentials that we have in the physical world and figuring out how to manifest them digitally in ways that are uh, centered around people. And so this is how the Verifiable Credentials Working Group defines it. It's a, um, their goal is to express credentials on the web in a way that is cryptographically secure, privacy respecting and automatically verifiable. And what they mean by verifiable credential is a um, anything that we might have in our wallet plus new things we might imagine. And I think about it too as like a universal language for anybody to issue any credential to anyone for any reason. So it could be very, very serious like my 16 years of medical training encapsulated in a degree and it could be I went to yoga class last night or I got like I went shopping at my local store and I brought a certain amount of stuff and that could all be packaged in a verifiable credential because just like HTML or email you can do all sorts of things in email but there's still a protocol around it so then it's readable by other people and it's the same is true with these credentials. And in this ecosystem, there are three parties that we talk about, the issuer, the party that's issuing the verifiable credential, the holder, usually the subject. So if I get a degree, I hold my own degree in my own digital wallet and the verifier where I might present it. And the thing that anchors this is both the, is the issuer is able to sign their documents using um, their public, pri their, the private key of their public private key pair, and the issuers are storing decentralized identifiers, some of them using blockchains and others using distributed hash tables, so that those um, keys are easily look upable by the verifier. And what this means is that um, the issuer and the verifier aren't actually ever needing to actually form a technical federation they're able to believe those credentials because of the signatures that are attached to them. So um, I never thought that I was as, as an aspiring, you know, um, I never thought that we would actually be focused on government issued credentials, but it turns out that's where the market is for these things in the sense that um, Western liberal democracies really want to um, support their citizens being able to prove attributes about themselves online, and they also don't want to be in the middle of those transactions. They don't want to touch it. They're like, because right now in the paper-based world, they don't touch it either, right? So. Um, it's been a really interesting journey as a community um, around the internet identity workshop to um, 
to bring this to life. So with that, I'm finished what I want to share and we can go into the, some of the questions that we had for each other. Um. Okay, I have questions uh, for you. Yes. Uh, first for you, Kalia, since you've been researching this for the longest time, uh, first I'd like you, I would love to hear from you just an explanation of what uh, public private keys are, just so this is kind of understandable yeah. to someone who might be familiar. And then I would also like to hear from you what are some of the uh, obstacles kind of hampering the wide, uh, wider adoption of standards like this, like how how do you think governments react to this or, or those big organizations? Yeah. So this is one of those things where we try and explain public-private key pairs and you can go down all sorts of rabbit holes. I think um, what distinguishes, I'll, I'll sort of um, start up by sharing that the, um, the default in sort of cryptocurrency land is to have your public key or a hash of your public key be your identifier. And that there is no way really to rotate in and, and have, um, or it's just more complicated. So the, the folks in digital identity land abstracted that. So you have um, a decentralized identifier with it, a did document with a public private key pair. And what cryptography allows you to do is prove that something came from you without giving away the password, which is your private key. Right, so it's it's a lot of fancy math that I usually don't try and explain in in a minute, um, but I think it's um, it it for, affords a lot of possibilities that um, support the communication of um, of veracity, like knowing where knowing something came from somewhere for sure is possible with crypto. I think that's the important part. Um, can, I, can I attempt to do a very quick explanation yeah, of it? Because I, I just love sharing this concept. So basically, if I if I wanted to send an encrypted message to you uh, before public and private keys existed, then I would have to, I could send you a message, but then we, we needed to have a secure channel over which we could uh, communicate the key for you to decrypt the message. Yeah. With a public and private key, private key uh, pair, um, I have a public key and then a private key that I don't share with anyone. But my public key, I broadcast to the world, and Kalia yeah. also has hers. So I, what I do is I take Kalia's public key. Yeah. If I want her to read something, right, encrypted, and then I. I encrypt it with her public key and then she can decrypt it with her private key. And I can I want uh, something, if I want someone to know that uh, something came from me, so if I want to digitally sign something, all I have to do is I encrypt it with my private key and then people can decrypt it with my public key, which is available out there. So they can know that it came from me. Yeah. And I think that in a context, especially now where you can have deep fake technology with like videos of people saying things, this is increasingly urgent. It's important. And yeah. I think there, there will be no way around it, really. Yeah. Right. And I'll say that the, the decentralized identifier um, sort of systems that we're working in our community, part of the reason they're potentially powerful is that they, um, they support being able to look up those keys, right? Um, because there's, where do you find the keys is the next problem <laughs> once you have them. So there's a question um, here that's um, asking you about IDENA and says, how does it solve the civil problem? Can I always pay a few friends or a troll farm to solve Sudoku's for me and then give me the keys? No. 
Yeah, so I, that, that's, a, that's a question I think the community itself has uh, continued asking time over time that could a bot farm come and overtake the network essentially or uh, could you sell off your identity um, to someone else? So essentially, uh, something uh, which is baked into the program is that when you have created the identity, even if you move it away, um, you still could essentially terminate it in our way. Um, so when you transfer it over, there is always a possibility that the original identity creator could terminate it on top of you. So there's that added uh, risk, which is sort of at, baked into the system, uh, which deters people from doing that transaction. Um, second is um, the whole angle of UBI, right? So the theory is that if you are doing the validation yourself, you would essentially have the benefit, which would outweigh the benefit of someone else paying you for doing that job for you. So that's in its essence um, um, what uh, we have been thinking that it would work uh, in the long term. So far it has worked and uh, we haven't really seen any sort of uh, similar tax uh, coming in or people trying to break the network, but uh, that definitely is welcome because that will help us put more stronger measures in place as, as the network grows. Cool, thanks. So there's a question for you, Paula. What is the ultimate vision of Democracy Earth and where would you like it to be in 10 years or more? Um, I hope that in 10 years or more, uh, we are completely obsolete and don't exist. Um, but the ultimate vision is just to enable technology for people to self-organize on, on the internet, you know, in a censorship resistant way so nobody can take it down. And I will say my personal vision with this is not necessarily to create alternative systems, but to make, by creating this possibility of exit, to make the institutions that we have stronger and more receptive and more responsive not even responsive i mean actually representative of what system of what uh, citizens want so i think that it's very difficult to innovate inside government so it's good to like have this space where you can experiment with like a low in a low risk environment and then hopefully from that, uh, bring those technologies to, to the institutions that we have. That's, you know, my, my personal vision. Yeah, for this. excellent. And then um, Adam would like to know if IDENA or Democracy Earth has plans to use parts as it did specification or verifiable credentials. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I, I think um, so far uh, what IDENA has been um, majorly focused on is the stability and how the network can scale beyond, you know, uh, just thousands to actually millions. And uh, eventually once that happens, the basic infrastructure of what, how, and things built are on uh, in IDENA, they could, yes, be extended out into the DID domain. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that the ever-growing developer community, which we have in IDENA, someone sooner and later will come up with that to bridge those gaps. Great. Um, with democracy, I think, and, and I think that that's also true for ID. Now we're kind of investigating a different aspect of the problem, but I think that adopting those standards is inevitable. It's a must, and you know, eventually, our what we're doing is not kind of end use. It's not facing uh, people who are who want to authenticate themselves yet. But once the technology is at that point, then that's uh, obviously it's inevitable. It's a must. Cool. Um, so, Supriya, what um, what inspired you to get involved with Idina in the first place? Yeah, um, awesome. I, I'll, I'll uh, talk about it uh, in my capacity of a user experience professional. So um, I have always been worked on applications and ecosystems in emerging markets where uh, the understanding of digital literacy is very, very different. It, it's not as mature as your Western governments, or Western democracies are, right? Um, uh, where people still think Username, passwords, and accounts are 
this nascent uh, techno technology and the aspect of their lives they're still starting to understand doing something on blockchain is like light years away <laughs> in that kind of situation right and that's where um, it was really interesting about um, Idena that it masks away all the complexity which inherently comes with blockchain you know like this 26 code alphanumeric character what is this I, I don't know about this publicly right so um, when you move that away and sort of really lower the ba barrier by making it easy and fun at the same time where it's going back to the basic ability of storytelling um, that's something which was really interesting for me um, in terms of how uh, Idina has been trying to solve validation in a really fun and engaging way which is universal beyond the barriers of languages and your digital background your education background things like that so uh, yeah that was something which was sort of main driving factor for me to um, continue um, observing the network um, for five minutes yeah cool um and then these i'm gonna draw on the question um that you um, put forward, Supriya, for Paula, mm -hmm. which is in decentralized governance structures, how important do you think privacy is for members taking part in the governance? And mm -hmm. could the outcome be perhaps influenced if the anonymity of the participating members wasn't there? Um, so that's, you know, it's a, it's a difficult question. <laughs> I don't have it's, the it's, answer. It's, it's, but, yeah, <laughs> it's, but, it's very loaded. Um, uh, sorry, Paula, for interrupting you. So the no, reason no. why I asked is was because um, you know um, uh, you talked about uh, the current situations in the most powerful government in the world, right? And how um, uh, the uh, sort of nature of events came to be in 2016, 2017. Uh, the idea was that uh, if you didn't really know whom to target with fake information or misinformation. Could that outcome have been different? Like, I mean, that 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 was something which sort of stemmed that question, and um, and that's related to what you know democracy as Earth is uh, trying to solve for. Yes, um, yeah, I think you know we have only three minutes, so yeah. just try to uh, be very very short. But I think that we have. What I, what I mentioned before about, you know, the dystopia not being in a few years, it's now, it's so mm -hmm. true. Like we already know how, who you're going to vote for just by analyzing your data. And okay. we know exactly what message we have to send it to you and how many times we have to send that message for you to change your opinion. Like yeah. that's, you know, it's a humbling thing because where is our human agency in all of this? But that's you know the that's the reality um also i i think that there's a lot to be seen with full anonymity right now in the blockchain space you do have that with proof of stake but it's not an ideal solution because yeah. for, it's anchoring on on finance so it leads to mm -hmm. plutocracies and you know the experiences that we do have with full anonymity online on forums are scary yeah. so I am interested in seeing how this is going to develop. And I think that somewhere we have to find a middle ground mm -hmm. uh, where we are also building with some form of additional trust. That's, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And that, that area as well, like this trust, like verifiable credentials are great, but how do you actually know what the meaning of them is and who created them and, and what were, was their intended meaning? And so one of the things we're seeing in, in the, the space that I'm part of leading is work on governance frameworks for um, different entities that issue credentials to agree on what they mean. Um, and so I'm really hopeful about the future of digital identity. Um, if folks want to connect with my work, um, I'm at identitywoman.net and the Internet Identity Workshop. And um, if you guys can just share your final thoughts as we have less than a minute left. Yeah. Um, um, sorry, I, I, uh, I'm not sure if I uh, understand it, uh, everything. About your final that. thoughts. Um, We're going to end. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 
I, I think uh, in, in today's world, we, we, there are a lot of known unknowns and unknown knowns as well. Um, and it, it's a long, long road ahead. Um, it, it's going to be interesting to see how uh, the people who are at the forefront of exploring identity uh, continue to make progress. And after that, once we have arrived at a place where we think is something which is ready for everyone else to take notice, how are we going to uh, cross that chasm beyond that early adopter phase into the phase where people truly adopt it and understand what they're doing with it? Because right. it, it's a dub- double-edged sword. Definitely. And final thought, Paula? Um, I think my, my final thought is just that I hope that we can understand that for anything that you care about, gender issues, racial issues, anything, identity is central and mm-hmm. i think you know this is not like a uh, an academic speculation or anything i think this is one of the key issues uh for advancing human rights in in my humble opinion so i'd like to impress upon you know whoever's listening to this the centrality and the need for experimentation and yeah if you want to reach out uh Democracy Earth is on Twitter, and I'm also underlying uh, Paula Berman, and I'd be happy. I love hearing about uh, this topic, so please do reach out. Great. Thank you so much. It's great to be part of Radical Exchange, and hopefully we'll see each other in person next year. Yes. Bye-bye. Have a good day.